All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's conversation. Uh, we're, we're seeing everybody starting to load up as we speak. Um, my name is Tyson Barker, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director at the Aspen Institute, Germany. Um, as you may recognize by my accent, I'm also an American, um, but I am the local uh, American embed here in the Aspen Institute network in Europe. Um, and we are really delighted to have you guys here for this on the record conversation with six, six Aspen Institutes joining together to co-host uh, this event. Uh, Aspen, Germany, of course, Aspen Central Europe, based in Prague, Aspen, uh, Romania, based in Bucharest, Aspen Italia, which has several offices in Italy, uh, Aspen France, and Aspen, the newest Aspen in Europe, Aspen Kiev, uh, based of course in Ukraine. Um, delighted to have this great mix of people. We have so much interest in this conversation uh, because, of course, we have two uh, congressional representatives here, and not just any two, but the two Euro watchers uh, from the House of Representatives, uh, Congressman Bill Keating and Congressman Adam Kinsinger. Uh, they are the chair and ranking member for the European and Eurasian Subcommittee in the House Foreign Affairs Committee and have a really interesting background. I'm going to briefly introduce them and then the topic and then uh, hand it over to them and then get our conversation going. So uh, Congressman Keating is, represents the ninth district uh, in Massachusetts, which is home to some of the nation's oldest communities, including Plymouth, uh, Cape Cod, Nantucket, uh, Martha's Vineyard, etc. cetera. Um, and in addition to his, uh, his role as chair on the European Eurasian Subcommittee, uh, he sits on the Armed Services Committee. So he's really at this cross-section of national security and foreign policy in the House. Uh, Congressman Adam Kinsinger is from the 16th Congressional District of Illinois. He's a Republican. Uh, Congressman Keating is a Democrat, uh, representing 14 counties. And in addition to his seat on the Foreign Affairs Committee, is on the Energy and Commerce Committee, and is a uh, vet, uh, an Air Force vet who has served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so I want to thank them both for being here. We're going to give it over to the chairman to speak first, but just a couple of quick ground rules. We want this to be more of a, a town hall, a kind of transatlantic town hall to really connect uh, Europeans with uh, the Euro watchers in the house. So if you have questions, uh, all you have to do is raise your digital hand, or you can write your questions and I will read them. Or if you're calling in, a uh, hit star nine, and we'll be sure to get your questions. Please name and identify yourself and also direct your question at one of the two congressmen. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Congressman Keating uh, for some opening remarks and then to uh, Congressman Kinsinger. Tyson, thank you very much. And thanks to the Aspen Institute for setting this up. Adam, it's great to be with you uh, virtually. It's better to be in person, but uh, I was starting to do that in Congress uh, slowly, uh, given the COVID-19 virus. Uh, uh, you mentioned, Tyson, that this is, uh, I represent the town of Plymouth in the U.S., Plymouth, Massachusetts, and uh, sadly, this was going to be the 400th anniversary and a major celebration uh, of one of the first transatlantic uh, connections. That was the Pilgrim's Landing uh, in Plymouth, and we had great participation from Europe. I'm afraid much of that's going to be uh, interrupted because of the COVID-19 virus, but I think in today's discussion, uh, what I hope uh, we come away with is, you know, acknowledgement of some of the challenges that exist in that current transatlantic alliance, but also uh, looking, at, obviously, at the focus of the COVID-19 virus, its implications. Uh, also, something that's in the news, at least in the U.S., has slipped into the background. Uh, all the other uh, conflicts in the world and crises in the world that we're dealing with that have taken a back page in the media to the, to the virus itself and its implications. And, and look at uh, the current situation in terms of a realistic appraisal where we stand. And number two, uh, I think hopefully a, an opportunity uh, to have a greater connection, a more profound connection uh, than we currently do on major issues. And I think uh, our reactions uh, on both sides of the Atlantic to uh, this terrible pandemic uh, might reinforce and provide opportunities for greater discussion and progress in that regard. So I hope we accomplish both things today. Uh, and again, thank you for as part of this. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Congressman. I mean, you 
you laid out a big framework and one can just dive into the issues, NATO, uh, trade, China, so many issues that this could be used as a springboard to really reinforce that transatlantic connection. Um, uh, Congressman Kinsinger, uh, maybe you can give us some uh, opening words and then we can start the discussion. Yeah, thanks. And uh, to the chairman, it's good to be with you again, as you mentioned, virtually. I don't know what I look like because I had to, I had to in a scramble, end up using my iPhone because my, my stuff. So I don't even know what's behind me. But uh, uh, thanks for everybody for being uh, on the line. This is really important. This is something that uh, we're having pretty, uh, actually quite a few discussions about all the time. So I'm on the new uh, China task force and uh, we're dealing with issues, whether it's supply chain, uh, whether it's 5G issues, uh, you know, how are we going to deal with this? It's not just about blaming China, although we need to get to the bottom of what happened, what was known. One of the things I think that's the most important to talk about here, though, uh, is post-pandemic. So I think when the uh, smoke all clears, whether it's in Europe or the United States, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of wreckage. And looking at, you know, third world countries and looking at European countries and looking here in the United States, what does that appear at the end? The thing I'm extremely passionate about talking about is in that carnage, do we allow uh, China to come in and be the rescuer with money? Uh, it's a tough decision to turn down probably free dollars that come in, but how do we make sure that we maintain our independence and not just maintain our independence, but actually push back against uh, what we've seen uh, in terms of PPE and what we've seen in terms of supply chain issues. So this is going to be the most important conversation, I think, probably in my congressional career is uh, post-pandemic security, post-pandemic cooperation. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from everybody about that. So thank you. And uh, we're ready to do this. All right. Uh, th thank you so much, Congressman. Um, I'm going to kick it off with the first question uh, for, for the chairman. Um, you know, as an American living in, in, in Europe, I, I look at the list of, of topics that we're dealing with on the European side, and it really does rhyme with what's happening in the United States. Debates around testing, debates around PPE, masks, infrastructure, supply chain security, social distancing, exit strategies, here in Germany, state federal coordination, big issue, and then vaccine testing and clinical trials. Um, even when you look at the, the number of, face, uh, of cases and the number of deaths in the United States, we're looking at uh, 1.5 million cases and 90,000 deaths. In Europe, we're looking at uh, 1.5 uh, million cases or a little bit over 1.5 million cases and 191,000 deaths. Um, you know, these, we're, we're experiencing parallel situations, but are we talking to each other enough? And if not, what should we be talking to each other about? Well, certainly uh, we're, we're suffering through uh, the same global uh, challenges we have with the virus. But even Europe and uh, the U.S., we're experiencing uh, a different strain, it seems, the early detection, early science uh, investigation as to how this affects children. It seems to be something that's not affecting Asia, uh, but affecting Europe and the U.S. more. So this research that clearly, if we coordinate, will be helpful. I think learning. Uh, as you mentioned, Tyson, you know, different countries have a different approach to uh, the lockdowns, if you want to call it this, and the reopenings. We have different approaches in the States. We could learn from this. We can learn from Germany uh, with some of the things that and I think, uh, and that can help, that kind of shared information can help us. Um, uh, the discussions about pulling out of the World Health Organization, I don't think are productive ones. I think we, the U.S. has a greater role in shaping change there and reform if necessary uh, by being inside of that. So as they're having their virtual meeting around the time we're doing this, uh, I hope that uh, we could reevaluate that. I hope we could reevaluate uh, our role. I know that uh, US and Russia were the two con major countries that didn't participate in uh, just a week or so ago, uh, the effort for raising $8 billion in, in this kind of research and how to outreach to other countries. But in the short term, we realize a few things here. Both uh, sides of the Atlantic have had trouble with the supply chain, uh, with personal protective equipment, uh, with the ingredients that are used in, in testing and the testing issues, even uh, with uh, you know, some of the sophisticated equipment that deals with that. This is a, a time when we should reopen discussions and, and have a, a combined effort 
now that we've both experienced this, how we can better secure each other's ability to deal with this in the future. Uh, and I think that's reinforced. So I think one thing we could do right off the bat is deal with uh, taking away or reducing medical tariffs, healthcare medical tariffs. We should move quickly, I think, at, at this time, because we see the necessity of that. Uh, removing those medical and healthcare tariffs, uh, as I mentioned, deal with the supply chain procurement issues and storage. We can have reservoirs that are better ourselves uh, if, we're, if we have that kind of uh, agreement in place. Uh, we also have to look at the uh, trade issue uh, itself, and that's something I think we're going to discuss uh, as this broadcast goes on, uh, as well as our common concern of China. Uh, China is pushing towards, as we speak, disinformation on this, trying to uh, propel, uh, you know, the uh, inefficiency of democracies and the efficiencies of authoritarian type governments. Russia and Iran are joining in on this. As a matter of fact, all three of them have joined in on this disinformation campaign. We have to fight this together. Uh, and we have to deal with underlying issues. It's clear that climate change uh, and, and uh, air quality and uh, certain living conditions, uh, dietary conditions, all those things are factors, underlying factors making this pandemic worse. And these are things we can work on together. So those are big issues. It's a big list but it's a tremendous opportunity to help the security uh, of Europe, the security of the U.S., and uh, our health healthcare security in the, and economic security in the, in the process. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. We have our, our first question from the audience. Uh, I'm going to give it to uh, Ivan Hodic. Ivan, you are up. Please identify yourself and ask your question. All right, Thank you, you can... Tyson. Yeah, yeah. now uh, I have Perfect. time. Sorry. Thanks a lot, Tyson. Thanks a lot, uh, Congressman. Uh, I am. Uh, my name is Ivan Hodac. I'm the uh, the chairman of the uh, Aspen Institute Central Europe, um, and I have a question to uh, Congressman Keating. Uh, you have given us a list of uh, issues uh, on which uh, we should be working together. You have been using the words "would help," "reevaluate," "should reopen." but you never said what we are doing. Uh, could you please uh, clarify why all these things I only should, would, and reevaluate? Re uh, why aren't we doing it? Uh, this is exactly the time when we should work together. We are in it together. Uh, so uh, why aren't we doing it? What are the two, three key reasons why you are using the should, would? and others. And by the way, uh, both uh, congressmen, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the reason I use that language is because that's my view of reality uh, as it stands now. Uh, one of the things we did not anticipate together, I don't think, even though there's been planning and there'll be debates about uh, uh, what our prior uh, position should have been, uh, I'm sure in both sides of the Atlantic, I don't think uh, even though experts and our security people, our military people, our healthcare people, both sides understood the potential for this. But when it happens, it's different. So that reality has brought home the idea that uh, we have not done these things. Why? Uh, I think the pandemic's reality uh, has forced us to, to view this for that. I don't think we were looking at the possibility, uh, any of us, uh, as strongly as we could have. Uh, and I do think part of it is there's a strained relationship compared to what it has been in recent years, uh, you know, uh, between uh, Europe and the U.S. of late. Uh, I think the, the tariff issue clearly uh, demonstrates that, uh, the imposition of security tariffs, something I didn't agree with, something that I didn't think the president had the power to do, uh, and something that I, I know caused uh, great concern with our European allies being termed a security risk as a basis for doing it. So there has been uh, a situation compounded, I think, by feelings of nationalism in Europe, uh, feelings in the US of a go it alone kind of strategy. Uh, so we weren't in the best place in the first place because of the relationships itself and some deterioration. 
And, and secondly, uh, the pandemic itself, the reality woke us up. So that's why I use those terms. Uh, and I think uh, those same uh, terms, I think, can be used. Because underlying all this, we still have strong alliances. We still have strong uh, allegiance to NATO. We still understand the security risks we both face. Uh, so uh, I, I think that this is a great opportunity. But the reason I use those words is because I think they reflect current reality. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in on this if I can. Um, look, the uh, <clears throat> I I think that here we have to we have to be very realistic about how we look at this situation right now. Uh, there are some that are you know stressing that there's a difference between a European COVID and the Asia COVID. Well, Europe has a more than likely mutated strain of that which came from Asia. Let's keep in mind that China, when they knew this thing was communicable. Uh, they banned all international, all travel, all domestic travel from Wuhan, China to the rest of China. And they not only did not ban, but encouraged travel to the rest of the world. Now, you can take your, you know, kind of whatever you think is the reason for that. <clears throat> I'm not going to say it out loud till we know more. Uh, but there is a reason that domestic travel was banned. And they said, yeah, you can go ahead and fly to the United States, to the West Coast, to Europe. Um, when we talk about the WHO, Look, I think that the U.S. shouldn't walk away from the WHO, but I have no problem with defunding it as a way to get rid of the head of the WHO, who's had conversations with President Xi, who for many, many days, he actually was the, the, the deciding vote against declaring this a world pandemic. We know his prior relationship with China. We know that he said China had been the most transparent regime, basically, in recent memory. And then we know that when people like me started attacking China for what they did, people like me were called racist. Because how dare we even do that? No, it's because I take the facts of what's going on. So while the United States and Europe have had differences in the past, and we always will, I think right now is the moment where we can say, yeah, we're going to have these differences. But there are 300,000, 100,000 dead Americans, 200,000 dead Europeans, which is interesting because here in the United States, it's always the U.S. toll versus just Italy or just the U.K. Really, if you compare the U.S. and the Europe, it's basically the same. You guys have a higher death number, but we have this about the same infected. So that said, when we look at this impact that 300,000 dead Europeans and Americans have had to us, uh, it really puts into perspective our differences, which is they're almost nothing. So why has it been would, could, should? I think there's too much focus on, you know, look, Trump offends me sometimes, and I'm a Republican, right? I don't like his tweets. I don't like some of the things he says. Uh, but if focusing on his policies to an extent sometimes with Europe, or if you look at Ukraine with lethal weapons to push back against Russia, sometimes they're not that bad. So I think our focus as European and U.S. partners has got to be in the future. Don't let Trump's tweets offend you. Let's just work together to make sure that we are preventing China from taking advantage of a post-pandemic world that they facilitated. You both, you both have talked about China and you both talked about uh, securing supply chains um, and the importance of coordinating on this. We have a question from Central Europe, which is, is for uh, Congressman uh, Kinsinger which is how feasible from your point of view is coordinating positions with the US, the EU and the UK vis-a-vis -vis China in the WTO? How, how you're gonna have to ask that, how easy is it to coordinate within that? Or? How feasible is it? So in other words, if, if the United States is looking oh, to uh, impose retaliatory tariffs on, the, on China or, or create situations to bend Chinese behavior, how feasible is it that they coordinate that action with, with Europe? Uh, I think it's, it's feasible. I mean, look, we're in a world now, and I'm a free trader, okay? I'm a free market guy, but we're in a world that, you know, in 1980 didn't exist. We didn't have a situation where there are 100,000 and more counting dead Americans because China hit a virus because they didn't tell the truth. Uh, so now as we go forward, I think some of the rules that may have existed in the past are going to have to not exist in the future. It, and, and by the way, the other thing too, when we talk about securing supply chains, at least in, in terms of when I talk about it, I'm not talking about saying bring everything to the United States of America. I think the key is finding uh, if there's 25, say, significant vulnerabilities that the U.S. and Europe has in the supply chain, 
how do we secure the most, the, uh, the six or 10 most valuable and most important? For instance, penicillin. The United States doesn't make penicillin. 70% of it is made in China. When the United States went after China initially in this, and China said, we will let the U.S. burn in a sea of coronavirus, by the way, that was a massive threat. Uh, that is t the impetus to us and to Europe to wake up on this. So I think what's feasible is saying, okay, here are the different supply chain vulnerabilities. We need to find first is we'd love to bring them to the United States. If that's not feasible to a ally of the United States, like Europe, if that's not feasible to a less competitive, uh, you know, friend, I guess, however you call it, maybe it goes to Vietnam or Indonesia. But I think that's where all of us are going to have to get together, put our heads together, figure out those most important supply chain vulnerabilities and figure out how we can work. And that will take some government payment and subsidies from all of our countries, too, I think. We have a question from uh, uh, Musafer Sinel. From the, he's the director of the Center for Modern Turkish Studies uh, at, at Ist, uh, the Istanbul Sahir University. And he asks, uh, several liberal states have been trying to take advantage of the COVID-19 crisis, i.e. Russia, China, Turkey, and present themselves as accountable players in global politics. Uh, how do you elaborate the possible ramifications to European politics? And I guess you could just say transatlantic politics, uh, perhaps uh, Congressman Keating and then uh, Congressman Kinsinger. Well, I think that's a serious threat. Uh, besides those countries themselves, uh, they also include Iran. And uh, so we're talking about China a lot, we should, uh, and Russia. But Iran is involved in that, as well as uh, these other states trying to, uh, I think, play the card of authoritarianism during a crisis. That's historically, that's been done. People uh, in the midst of a crisis, and I think you're seeing it in Russia right now with Putin trying to even solidify his hold more uh, in Russia using the pandemic. So you will see that. And that's what's important about uh, sticking together and uniting. You know, uh, President Trump also said that uh, she was uh, transparent just at the end of January. So it wasn't just the head of the World Health Organization. It was our own president at the time saying that. So the key dealing with this, I think, is, and it addresses the couple of questions that preceded this, is uh, U.S. role. Uh, U.S. role as a leader. You know, I don't think we can be as effective as a country, and I don't think the transatlantic alliance is as strong uh, if the U.S. sort of sits in the gallery making comments as opposed to being in the arena itself using its influence, as it has in the past. I've, heard, I've talked to so many of our uh, officials uh, in Europe during this uh, situation, private conversations we've had, and the one thing that is reinforced every time is uh, and we should take it as a compliment as a country, the U.S. should. Uh, they want us to be more uh, involved. They want us to assume that leadership role that we've historically had. And I think that's one of the issues that ties the, the, this question and the preceding question together, is the fact that uh, U.S. has to exert that leadership role, not just for its own self-interest, but for its, our collective self-interest. If we're worried about China and how to deal with China, Russia disinformation, campaigns, uh, their use of economic power, their use of this pandemic to exert more authoritarian control and weaken democracy. We have to do it together. Uh, together, we're half the world's GDP. Together, uh, we have the greatest security force in the world. Uh, together, we have the greatest institutions. We hold the same values. So uh, I think that a big issue is uh, U.S. leadership and not sitting uh, in the sidelines making comments. Yeah, I, yeah thanks. I, I, uh, I agree with the premise of the question. Um, I also think that, you know, the key and the important thing is for leaders here, uh, whether in Europe or the United States, to be less interested in the domestic, you know, pod shots <clears throat> and actually take a focus on foreign policy. Uh, you know, for instance, the um, one of the greatest things that can be used right now, so the greatest strength of whether it's uh, democracies or, you know, us particularly, is our freedom of information. The fact that you can go on Facebook and write anything, right? which I think sucks, but it's a good thing, right? It's, it's freedom. Uh, but Twitter's, you know, not, not the best thing ever. But anyway, uh, that's our greatest strength is that freedom, but it's also our greatest weakness by authoritarians. I mean, 
if you get on Facebook, if you get on my Facebook, so I have like a, you know, a private Facebook where it's just my friends and stuff. And, uh, and I look at my wall once, probably a month, not my wall, but like the feed and holy cow, the conspiracy theories that are out there right now, whether it's on my side of the aisle, you know, masks are just a way of having the government have control or it's the other side of the aisle, which is, you know, Republicans don't care about people, that kind of stuff. I mean, th these conspiracy theories exist on both sides. And China and Russia feed it. We know it for a fact. I, I, we all got like 800 text messages in the United States about knowing that there was going to be an impending lockdown by President Trump. Doesn't matter that it's not even legal to do. We found out those were spread by Russia and China and the panic and the economic damage. This is where we have to unify and come back and fight back and consist and resist our temptation you know, to attack our European partners or attack President Trump in the United States if you're in Europe and actually focus on what we have in common. And whether that's dictators around the world or whether that's, you know, China in the future, uh, we have to just look past our, our tendency to get offended. Like, you know, in the 70s and 80s when it was all just about Europe, the United States and Russia. And we have to think anew. There is no Berlin Wall now that will serve as a symbol to our people that we can just point to to keep them united. It has to be our ability to articulate that. It's a great point from both of you guys about, you know, social cohesion and how do you how do you maintain it, especially when you're talking about openness, when people are, how do you harden openness, essentially. Uh, we have two questions uh, who want to ask by voice. Uh, first, John Kornblum, and then second, Schmidt. So, John, you're up first, and then we'll go to the second question. Okay, thank you very much. I'm John Kornblum. I'm a resident of Berlin, but I'm calling this morning from Nashville, Tennessee, where my wife and I have a house and where we are, shall we say, sitting out the storm. Mm -hmm. um, so I am, have a, a sense perhaps of both sides of the, uh, the thing. The fact is, at the moment, and I don't think this is a, an outrageous thing I'm saying, that the European view of the United States is defined almost entirely by Donald Trump. And it's a negative one. And there's a poll published in the German press this morning, which says that 40% of those asked believe that China is a better ally for Germany than the United States. So there is a very big problem with this president. But I'm not asking this question to talk about that, but to talk about the fact that the same kind of un unhappiness and distrust with the United States was expressed during the administration of Barack Obama. And the difference between the two is not so much the personalities, which of course are major, but the fact is that already since the Bush administration, the United States has been withdrawing from global leadership. And Barack Obama withdrew from global leadership as much as anyone else. And if you look at the, shall we call the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, they are as isolationist as anybody on the right wing of the Republican Party. So we have a, a problem which is not tied to presidents. It's tied to the fact that uh, Congressman Kinzinger said it very well, the disappearance of the Berlin Wall also disappeared sort of the foundation of solidarity. And this, I think, is something that we're going to have to be dealing with in the future. And I would be interested to see how you believe that in, you are come from both uh, parts of the country, which are actually very internationalist. I come from Michigan, so I uh, know very much uh, the, the kind of situation in, uh, in Illinois. Europe constituents need to have a foreign policy and need to do things, but the country is not ready to do it. And what do you think needs to be done now to reawaken that understanding of America's role in the world? Great question. Uh, for Congressman Ken uh, uh, Keating and then Kinsinger. I think I mentioned that. Uh, I hope you're having a great time, by the way, in Nashville. Uh, a lot to see there. Uh, I think I mentioned that in terms of leadership. Uh, I think what I'm hearing uh, from my colleagues on the other side of the Atlantic is uh, the absence of leadership, even in common interests. We're, we're concerned about Africa both and everything that's going there. The, the people are saying, we'd love to be with you instead of China. You're not there. You're not present. Uh, um, Clearly, I think there's a difference. You compared the last two presidents in the sense that I think in Europe, there was a concern with Obama's presidency because he made an initial priority, the Pacific. 
Asia Pacific area as a concentration. And I heard at the time from our European colleagues, well, what about us? If that's gonna be the concentration. So I don't think the prior administration was moving away from the world. I think there was a concern in Europe that we were emphasizing Asia Pacific, which I think uh, initially that was the case. Uh, I think Secretary Kerry, with his European background and his interest, I think mitigated that. I think that uh, uh, Jim Mattis, our former uh, defense secretary, uh, I think uh, mitigated that with the Trump administration early on when he was there, uh, because Europeans, uh, I, I, I think the impact I got, the feedback I got was they really perceived uh, him as someone that understood and was effective within the administration. So uh, getting back to your question, we're here, Adam and myself, uh, and the Foreign Affairs Committee in Congress, because I think Congress is the, the direct answer to your question. If you're looking for uh, involvement uh, in, ter in terms of uh, openness to trade, to the issues we've discussed on healthcare and security issues, uh, Congress has been steadfast, uh, I think. It, and, that, and it's been bipartisan in that respect. So uh, I hope, and, and I'm, we're working hard, uh, all of us in, in Congress, to try and make sure that if, in that vacuum that there's an understanding. That's part of what the value of the Aspen Institute's broadcast is to hear, to, to reassure people that in the U.S. we understand this. In the U.S. political system, there's bipartisan support for uh, our relationship, uh, trans, you know, transatlantic relationships. So uh, that's the best answer I have in terms of how we approach this. Uh, I think it's there. I think it's there in our leadership, but I think right now it's largely there uh, in Congress uh, and, and we have to work harder. I've, I've tried, I know Adam's had tried uh, to work harder during these times to make sure that our security, healthcare, economic interests and values uh, aren't lost uh, and, and in fact can be uh, something that uh, I brought together during these difficult times. Yeah, I agree uh, with the uh, with the, the chairman in terms of uh, Congress playing a really important role. Uh, you can look at all these issues, and you know, even if we've had disagreements with President Obama on certain things, or President Trump, uh, Congress will pass. You know, sometimes four hundred and twenty-five to zero or to five. Uh, you know, things that are pretty consistent about our relationships. Uh, Think of the good work that Congress has done with the nation of Georgia, right? And I would encourage my European partners, by the way, to step up in the case of Georgia. You want to send a message to Russia that uh, the Europe is pushing back, that Europe and the United States is pushing back. Uh, let's push uh, Georgian NATO membership um, because we cannot allow the fact that Russia occupies Georgia to be the reason why we don't bring Georgia into our wheelhouse, or it will only encourage Russia to do the same thing. I appreciate the great question too because you mentioned about the German view of the United States versus China. And in the, in the 80s and 90s, our tendency would be to look back and say, that is a failure of US leadership that Germans feel that way. Germans are adults and they're very smart people, right? My family comes from Deutschland uh, in the 1850s, from Barstein, beautiful area, great beer. Um, but if you actually look back at it and say, these very smart Germans are making this decision, that is a failure of German leadership or German education or whatever the case may be, because by the way, China just basically is responsible for at least 300,000 deaths between the United States and Europe. There's no other way to put it. They knew they hit it. So we could have mitigated this virus for a quite, quite a bit had they only been honest. We know about how they sucked up all the PPE all around the world before they admitted the fact that this was communicable. So I would think the very smart German people who I know now look at the United States and China and say, Oh, heavens, we don't like Donald Trump's hair and he offends us sometimes, but at least he didn't hide the fact that there was a virus that would eventually kill 200,000 Europeans. That's what I think is going to be the difference. And that is not going to be an issue where we have to look to Donald Trump or to Congress to change that view. This is where Europe has to step up and European leaders and make the case to their own people. Because look, I would love to have, you know, a Ronald Reagan back out making that case every day, uh, but we don't have that. Uh, but what we do have is an opportunity for European leaders to step up and be clear with their people about what happened. We have a, a number of questions now. I'm going to bundle two NATO questions, one from uh, Alice Pinier, who's French, but she's at uh, Johns Hopkins Science as a professor, 
and uh, Claudio uh, Degeratu Digger from uh, Bucharest. And then we're going to go to Elmer Brock and uh, Ricardo Perisic, who is in Aspen, Italy. Um, so the first question, the, the written question is, what uh, role has NATO had in collective management of the pandemic? What concrete avenues can you think that it can take building lessons from the, uh, the crisis and for the future of the alliance? And related, uh, can you guys comment on how this could impact the defense spending uh, question uh, around, you know, national defense spending and transatlantic solidarity? So how is NATO being um, deployed now and what should this mean for the future of defense spending? And per, uh, um, perhaps, a key, oh, please, Kinsinger and then. Uh, well, I, I was, for NATO, how, uh, NATO, I don't think NATO has been very involved. Um, I don't know if it's the role of NATO necessarily to be involved in something like this, uh, except for, you know, defensive posturing when it comes to Russia and maybe expand that mission to include China. Um, I think ultimately, doesn't mean we, nobody's looking to go to war with China, I want to be clear. Uh, but we also aren't going to roll over for them either. Uh, but I think NATO can serve as a model uh, for us for maybe something in the future for a pandemic, a cooperation. NATO has been a great success. And, uh, you know, NATO has been an amazing thing where we have basically like-minded countries that can come together and deal with this. So uh, that's one thing. In terms of defense spending, I, I fear that defense spending is going to take a major hit at a time when it shouldn't. Um, you know, we're going to have a real question, uh, which is what does uh, the post-pandemic world look like? And, uh, and we're going to have to make some tough decisions. My hope is that we don't uh, buy into this retreat and isolate view because uh, this pandemic has shown us one thing. It's shown us that uh, what happens in the rest of the world really does affect us. So, All right. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Keating. Well, I, I think back immediately to uh, uh, Secretary uh, Stoltenberg's address to Congress and how well he was received. Uh, so the NATO relationship remains strong. Uh, and it remains strong for a reason. We just had information in the U.S. that uh, Al Qaeda uh, was behind, uh, uh, you know, the killings in Pensacola at our uh, military base. Uh, they were directly involved in plotting that. The, the, the second attack, really, on our soil planned since 9/11. So uh, Al Qaeda exists as a threat. ISIS exists as a threat, uh, and NATO security, information sharing, intelligence remains strong. It's important to start there. Uh, NATO has been involved uh, to an extent with procurement uh, of medical equipment and PPE. They've been involved in the supply chain issues. They can get involved more and perhaps will, but they have been uh, involved in that. So the same way you, we use our military uh, in the U.S. Uh, so that's been helpful. Uh, I do think that uh, in terms of going forward uh, with defense spending, uh, I think the 2% is a priority and should be adhered to. Uh, we still have the issues in, in Ukraine. We still have Georgia. We still have Russia being involved in our elections here as we speak uh, and elections and activities there. Uh, their involvement in Brexit. Uh, you could go on with Russia's involvement uh, in that respect. So uh, NATO remains important. Uh, from what their basic function is, what they can do going forward. But uh, we have to send a message too. Uh, and I was very concerned and uh, joined with many of my colleagues <coughs> uh, in, in, in a letter that uh, I co-led uh, on the cuts that occurred to the European uh, Deterrence Initiative, uh, taking that money away. We had hearings both on armed services, uh, where I'm a member, and on foreign affairs where from a bipartisan standpoint, from a European and U.S. standpoint, that was one of the more successful initiatives that we had. You know, that's building infrastructure in Spain and, and dealing with uh, our core Norway airports. This is where we joined with Europe on shared uh, security initiatives. And of all the pools of money that that could be pulled from, and uh, I think illegally so, taking it away from the budget without that kind of appropriation. That was a terrible example, pulling it from that. That's not gonna help our ability to push for the 2% uh, collection uh, among countries, the commitment, not just the collection, the commitment that was there. So uh, getting back to Congress's role, uh, I want people listening to be assured 
many of us in Congress were really extremely disappointed in that action about the European Deterrence Initiative pulling away the money uh, and spoke up about it. So uh, NATO remains key alliance uh, fabric that, that we can build on. And, and we've seen in terms of training in, in the Middle East and other areas where NATO has a bigger role. We'll see it in Africa uh, and we'll see it when there's conflicts uh, that are still there as that Al Qaeda information came forward and as we still are wary about uh, the regrowth of ISIS. We had uh, one person that I, I forgot to call on, his, uh, Schmidt. He's going to ask a question, then Emma Brock, uh, then Ricardo uh, Perisic from Aspen Italia, and then we'll get back to this list of, we've got about 11 open questions, so we'll, we'll, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. So Schmidt, you're up. And please identify yourself and direct your question at somebody. Uh, did you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hans Jaron Schmidt, former uh, civil servant of the Foreign Office. We were talking about assuming uh, political leadership. And this morning we had a very interesting discussion organized by the Kerber Foundation based upon a survey undertaken Pulse. It's quite well known. And I think it was a very interesting discussion. And of course, a lot of people correctly were worried about what is it, the outcome concerning what is it, how many people are in favor towards the United States and towards China. John Conbloom, he referred to that. But persuasive leadership means that say there should be a coordinated one. The Middle East, for example, you were referring to, and we refer always to only one partner and not to the others. Let's say we refer, for example, one to Tehran, the other to Saudi Arabia. The Middle East is, for example, a very good example where we failed. And of course, and that is still, what is it, a heavy burden on us because we have enormous difficulties to clear up the mess. But persuasive leadership means really we have to talk together. You, Congressman, you referred, for example, to Georgia. Georgia is a very interesting example. It's a bone of contention. Let's say if you are so proud of advancing democracy in Georgia, you have to refer to Saakashvili. At the beginning, it was very successful and afterwards not, from my point of view. That's to say we have to be very, very careful let's say referring to our successes in promoting democracy. And if we are not able to continue to promote, Georgia is certainly Mr. Schmidt, not- can you, can you ask your question? We've got 15 minutes. No, because he was referring to, let's say what we should do and what we have not done exactly. Let's say that certain people, for example, support certain initiatives of the United States and sometimes we are not in favor of. Let's say hmm. leadership has to be persuasive. I don't understand your question. What's the question? And Pro Congress Keating, he said, yes, bipartisan approach, the same inside your country. Let's say you don't should what is contribute to dividing, but you should try to find a consensus with your main allies as well. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. So um, it sounds like he's asking, you know, what, are we communicating enough? Is the communication robust enough? And are we do this, doing this in a bipartisan manner? Well, I don't think, I think my comment is clear that we're not communicating well enough, that we, uh, I think I was realistic about where we were, uh, but I still remain optimistic about where we can go. Uh, and that communication is important. Look, there were breakdowns. Uh, in the INF uh, treaty, there wasn't uh, a great deal of input. Uh, only afterwards was NATO asked. Uh, when we made the move pulling out of, uh, <clears throat> Syria with, with Turkey, uh, we left uh, and communicated uh, only in the last hours uh, with our allies that were on the ground, uh, pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal uh, and still trying to uh, keep it alive in some sense uh, on the, you know, with the Europe carrying that burden. Those are things that I have strong feelings about. Uh, but communication, is great, action is greater. Uh, and I think that we have to have the opportunity uh, now and in the post pandemic era to start dealing with these, start taking steps, uh, deal with the, do away with the medical and health tariffs, uh, pull back on the tariff situation, uh, rein, reinvigorate trade talks for free trade agreements. Uh, Make sure we're not pulling away from important initiatives like the European Deterrence Initiative. Be consistent. Uh, and I think that's, that's critical. 
So uh, communication's great, action's better. Here's the, here's the thing. So the chairman just spent 90% of his response attacking President Trump and what the U.S. is doing, right? We used to believe that we kind of hold that back past the water's edge. We can have some discussions about it. That's important. But the problem is, is it's not just the United States that's responsible for this. And that's my point with Germany is if the German people believe that China is a better partner, um, look, maybe we're not doing the best PR, <clears throat> but unless you like having your door nailed shut when you're locked down, and people screaming because they can't leave their house. If you like that response to coronavirus better, then fine. Then you know, but that is a failure of German leadership as well. And we just have to be honest about it. Um, in terms of the thing on Saakashvili, I don't, I don't get what the questioner was asking on that. Uh, I'm not going to get into the middle of that fight in, in in Georgia, but I will say this: he was not reelected. So uh, if that was the will of the Georgian people, democracy works. So sometimes democracy is messy. Georgia just had a real standoff on some um, on a uh, agreement to change their election system, but it appears that we've gotten through that. That like happens in our countries. We have very big standoffs, and they're very public and they're very messy. But that's democracy, and it sure beats having your door nailed shut and your family stuck inside without food because the state is more important than the individual. Like happens in China. All right, uh, we have ten more minutes, so I know we have a question from Emma Bloke and Ricardo Perisic from uh, Italy. And then I'm gonna go through a rapid fire from some of these questions that we have written. So Emma Bloch, you are up. Yeah, thank you very much for this possibility. Uh, I, my name is Emma Bloch. I'm a former chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the European Parliament, and now a senior fellow of, uh, of Aspen Institute, Germany. Uh, Congressman uh, Kinzing, I would like to uh, invite you to Warstein because at the moment I call from close to Warstein where I live. Ah. And uh, perhaps we can have a beer together there. Sehr good, sehr good. And uh, uh, the, I think I'm very uh, thankful to both of you. You made clear that we have common interest and that we should act more together in a partnership, not one decides and the others have to follow, but in a joint partnership to do that. But also we, uh, we have to teach each other more what the other is doing. When you talk rightly about Georgia and Ukraine, you have to know that uh, the European Union has opened the borders for the citizens of uh, the three countries who have a free trade agreement with the European Union, a free trade agreement which gives them a lot of chances. You have to see that the European Union's member countries have to give to Ukraine 21 billion dollars since the Russian aggression to Ukraine. And that should be taken into account also in the United States. That is much more, I think, 15 times more than the United States has given uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and this is also the type of burden sharing or the enlargement of European Union countries like Poland and so on to stabilize them. Uh, my point is that uh, this feeling is in part of the European uh, German population or European population. There is not the leadership, but there's a feeling, for example, in this situation that um, uh, President Trump looks for vac vaccines for United States citizens and uh, is always in competition with Europe. And uh, this approach is not seen from China, but I think it's the wrong approach from our side or point of view. But that is not a policy of the government. Uh, but we have also certain opinions in the United States about Europe that are not right. I think we should make clear that the United States supports European integration, not supporting Brexit, that is, uh, President uh, Trump has done that. And that we should come back to our negotiations on a free trade agreement together, that we can have combine our interests. We have common interest against China and partly against Russia on the, on the security side, but economically to, toward China. And when I see that 90% of all the stuff for antibiotics we use in Europe are produced in, in China, then it's a tr troublesome mistake on our side and probably also on your side. And therefore we should not look more together to common approaches in that question and change our language on both sides in that way that we can come back to this European-American relationship. The Thank difference you. to China... Thank you. So I'll, let's, China, let's, let's get to some States of these questions. That you, you put a lot out there, uh, Mr. Volk. Values, both. You Let and me China. just say, uh, 
first off, competition is good. I want to beat Europe to a vaccine. I want Europe to beat us to a vaccine because whoever gets there and if we're competitive in this, that's good because ultimately it's going to help all of us. Competition works in the free market. Um, secondly, on the uh, Georgia-Ukraine issue, you make a great point. You, uh, Europe has done a lot for Georgia and Ukraine and you don't get fair credit for that. Uh, and I think of that all the time and, and we appreciate it. Um, the same goes to the United States. Whenever we get on you know, calls or come visit, all we hear about is what the U.S. isn't doing. And we think about what the taxpayers of the United States have done consistently for Europe, including rebuilding it after World War II, including uh, holding off the Soviet Union, uh, including you know, what we've done in Kosovo, Serbia, et cetera. Um, so we feel the same way. But you know, I think what we have to understand is you know, in geopolitics, sometimes it's a lot easier to point out things, shortcomings than it is in successes, because I think we have so many successes that they just don't stand out. Uh, but you make a fair point about uh, all that Europe has done, and we deeply appreciate that. Uh, Congressman Keating, maybe the second point that he brought up, and we've had a couple questions on this, so I'm going to rack and stack a little bit, is, you know, what about the possibility of a transatlantic free trade agreement? Can we use this as an opportunity to be ambitious about the trade relationship? And then we have a question from Fred Irvin, I'm going to just bundle with this, which is, if the U.S. wants to curb China's uh, economic and political ambitions, why did the U.S. government pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement? Well, I was a uh, co-founder of the TTIP, we'll have to rename it uh, going forward, I'm afraid, uh, you know, caucus. Uh, I believe in uh, free trade with Europe. I think it's uh, economically and security-wise an imperative uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and I think we could move to that. There were different agreements. Uh, I wish that TTIP had preceded the Pacific uh, Agreement uh, because I think we would have had an ability to be successful. We spent the time, but there, there was no way of changing that because it would have been viewed as pulling out of that. But there were efforts made by colleagues uh, very much involved in that to try and put the TTIP agreement first, as unrealistic as that uh, would have been uh, in a practical sense. Now, 97% uh, of our uh, drugs come from China, manufactured in China. We share that uh, great reliance, over-reliance. This is something we can work on together uh, to deal with it. Uh, but I think we have to work together. And, 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 you know, one of the things is acknowledging reality. Uh, what I said before uh, was just reality, fact-based issues. And they're based on my discussions I've had with our European leaders uh, as well. Uh, and the, if the U.S. is going to be successful and our transatlantic relationship is successful, I think both sides have to uh, take a different posture. The U.S. can't have an attitude uh, of saying, well, we're here, we're doing this, but China is worse. The, you know, if there's something they don't agree with the U.S. policy, we're not going to be successful if the decision option is bad or worse. We have to have a conversation and act otherwise. Uh, and uh, there's an opportunity right now uh, on the heels of this uh, pandemic uh, to deal with these issues and, and to realize if we didn't realize before on both sides of the Atlantic that we are stronger together uh, and there will be a vacuum. China will move in, Russia will move in, Iran, they're coordinating these things. Uh, and uh, we have to make sure that we act uh, on that and show leadership in that regard. Uh, we have one more final uh, voice question from Ricardo Perisic from uh, Aspen, Italy. Ricardo, you are up. Yes, hello. Well, th thank you. That was extremely interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to intervene after Helmer because I, I share most of his points. Uh, Frankly, we, know, we all know that China has acted dis dismally all this pandemic uh, thing. But to blame China um, on, on the deaths that we are suffering won't take us very far. Um, it, in a way, all major pandemic since the Black Death of the 14th century have come to Europe from Asia. So, but the reason why we are suffering what we suffer in this case uh, is that we were not prepared. 
uh, and, uh, and, and what we are doing is to try to confront a situation that we had not, that we had not foreseen. To focus on China will, will, not, will not help us much to solve the problem. Uh, the real thing is that we do have a China problem. We have a China problem that goes well beyond the pandemic. Um, the good thing is that if we compare with a couple of years ago, uh, we at least seem to agree that we have a problem. Uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, forget about the opinion polls, you know, they, 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 have, they have much to do with European attitudes to President Trump rather than to anything else. Um, we do, do seem to agree that we have a China problem. We don't have a China policy. Um, the um, United States don't have a China policy. And, and, well, the Europeans are far away from having a China policy. We are, we are definitely far beyond uh, the United States, even in, in, in trying to develop a, a, China, a China policy. Um, one reason is that if we compare with the Soviet Union, China is a far more complex and sophisticated country than the Soviet Union ever was, uh, particularly on the economic point of view. Uh, the economy of the Soviet Union was practically irrelevant uh, through, the, through the Cold War. China's economy is far from being irrelevant. Um, so the first thing we should do is to develop a common uh, Chinese policy on the economic front. Maybe, maybe we can take that and, and pull it out, because you said we have a China problem, but we don't have a China policy. Uh, maybe as a final question to you both, I think this has come out as a big theme of this conversation. If we were to have a China policy, a transatlantic China policy, what should it look like in this crisis and afterwards? Uh, perhaps Congressman Kinzinger and then Congressman Keating. Yeah, uh, well, good point. Uh, I do, I, I am curious though, if the U.S., if this had originated in the U.S. and we hid this uh, for a while, would people still be saying, don't blame the U.S.? Come on, I mean, it's it's not their fault. I mean, we get blamed for, I, I think they'd be blaming us. Why, it's important to, to, to know the origin of this, and we'll get to that uh, eventually. But I also think what's important is to recognize, you know, when we go after and criticize China, and the response from the head of the WHO is to call it racism. So I guess I can only go after countries with people in charge that are white or with ethnicities that are white. Uh, so I can go after Russia. I can't go after you know, and criticize any country in Africa or Asia. Uh, that's why it's important to address these things because that cannot be the thing that we accept in the future. We have got to get past the political correctness and be serious about the future of our people. The questioner was correct in saying that now we agree we have a problem. And I think what that looks like going forward is Europe and the United States, obviously we will be the prime leader when it comes to a military posture in Asia. That's great. We're not expecting Europe to, to fill that role. Uh, but when it comes to things like supply chain, I'm a big supporter of TTIP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I wish we'd have plugged into all that. It's great to compete with China with free trade allies all around it. But I think it's working together on those supply chain issues, getting past, as Mr. Keating said, the idea of tariffs, and, uh, and recognizing that we do have a common enemy. And it's not gonna help to try to paper this over and make the Chinese government feel good. Their own people don't like them. We have to recognize Hong, we have to recognize Taiwan as a legitimate entity. And the WHO is not taking any you know, input from Taiwan because China writes, you know, so these are the kind of things we have to come to agreement on. We can't do it ourselves. You guys can't either, but together we can. And thank you all for having me. I, I deeply appreciate it doing this. Thank you, Congressman. Congressman Keating, final word. Well, thank you. Uh, China does bear uh, its responsibility in, in this regard. Uh, it's a lesson, though, that we should learn uh, about the importance of democracy uh, in the world and Western democracy in its leadership role. Uh, there were medical people, there were scientists that came forward in China. They were silenced. Uh, there were whistleblowers that came forward. They were silenced. We have a free press here in the West uh, and, uh, and we have democracy in the West. Imperfect as it is, it, it's so much superior. So the lesson to be learned here uh, as China and Russia, Iran, try and push uh, authoritarian 
you know, uh, dictates forward and saying how it's superior. Their weaknesses is it was in their authoritarian approach and culture. Now, uh, I think this, I think that uh, we've seen Europe just recently, the EU come together uh, with over 500 billion euros uh, to help each other at a point when uh, things were unraveling a bit there. Uh, there's a lot of dissension, not that that was not without its uh, commentary. But in the end, we saw European Union come together with that collective approach economically to come out of this. Uh, that's the reality we live in. And I can expand that further as a concluding note and say this, that's our reality in the US. It's your reality there. Uh, we cannot deal with the threats of China. And I agree that China is the number one threat, not Russia. And I agree that it was the number one threat before the pandemic. But perhaps we'll come to this understanding uh, on both sides and, and really forge ahead on a transatlantic alliance and realize this, as great as the EU is, its economy, uh, its power, as great as the US is, its economy, its power, we cannot be successful by ourselves. We have to come together. Uh, Transatlantic alliance can't be some merely some diplomatic term, a feel good term. It has to be real. And we have to start addressing those realities on both sides. If we do, that is the worst uh, news for China. That is the worst news for Russia or Iran uh, or those countries that are moving forward that we're concerned about, like Hungary, towards a more authoritarian uh, approach. That's our strength. And, and I hope uh, as we look at this uh, and, and reflect on today's broadcast that uh, we can come to a better understanding of that uh, because that's where our success lies. Uh, thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, to you both, uh, we have, uh, clearly we have the A-team uh, in Congress working on Europe. We are delighted to have you both in this session. We had, I mean, over uh, around 130 people on this call, and I counted just from the questions of 11 countries. So this is definitely something we pulled in internationally, transatlantically to have this conversation. A lot of good solutions mentioned, eliminating tariffs on medical supplies, working on supply chain resilience, uh, reinforcing NATO, and coming up with a potential transatlantic China strategy rather than a, just the China problem. Um, I think this is the, it's not the end, it's the beginning. Uh, clearly there are opportunities in crisis, and this is one, uh, to have more transatlantic town halls like this. So I want to thank you both, uh, and we will continue this conversation going forward. Thanks to you both, and thanks to everybody for participating. Thank you, Thank you guys.